Welcome to the Marathon Marketing Moment. In these podcasts we share tips on how to improve your photography business and make you more profitable. And now, here is your host, Mark Weber. Hi everybody, this is Mark at Marathon Press bringing you another Marathon Marketing Moment. We try to bring some topics uh, that will help educate you, inspire you, and motivate you along the way. And maybe bring you a little happiness too. So, Today, I want to introduce you to my guest, Nicole Bagley. Nicole is a PPA master photographer, craftsman photographer, certified professional photographer, and a pet photography specialist. She's also a published author. Her book is sold out, so um, I don't know if she will have that redone or we'll do another one. We'll get into that in a little bit. But um, Nicole is one of those people that practices what she preaches with her education, being an educator in our industry and having her own podcasts and, and workshops and everything else. I've always been a big fan of her style of photography, but also a big fan of her marketing. Uh, you're one of the few, Nicole, that really practice what you preach and uh, your branding and your education. I uh, can't say enough about I've used you a million times as examples of what to do right, especially with your website. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I've got you on the show here today. So welcome. Aw, thanks, Mark. Uh, happy to be here. Glad, glad. You know, the summer is going so fast. And the there's, is. <laughs> yeah, so many people are trying to figure out, you know, um, what this new world of photography is about. And one of the things that I've always had a passion for is pet photography, always. And my wife, you know, when we moved back to Nebraska here 15 years ago, the first portrait she hung on our wall was not of our family. It was of our pets. So <laughs> what does I that tell you? I mean, I'm pretty sure if you looked at my camera roll that I have more pictures of my pets than my kids. And when my husband and I travel, we end up sending pictures of the animals more than the children. <laughs> I know. <Oops. laughs> <laughs> we were talking about that. Uh, we were at the Animal Image Makers Conference back in April. And, you know, everybody, the first thing they bring out their phone, and it is. Right. We're all just sharing pet photography. And then it's like, oh, but yeah, you're married and you have kids too? Yeah, oh, yeah, right, well, that's right. nice. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but get back to the dogs. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. So with you being an industry leader and teaching workshops and doing everything else, I wanted to have you... Um, as a guest because I would like to talk about uh, getting started in pet photography because it isn't as simple as it sounds you know when you start to work with animals it can get a little you know when you don't know what you don't know you're dangerous and mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I had a friend of mine that got bit by a Sharpe he leaned down went to pet it and he got his face too close and the dog bit his lip and he had to get stitches and it's little things like that that you just don't want to have to learn the hard way. So mm -hmm. if it's good with you, let's let's start our topics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the case in any genre of photography. I mean, you have their specialist techniques for newborn photography, especially, gosh, all those pose newborns. Like if you were going in thinking like, oh, I'm just going to prop this baby up on his hands and <laughs> it can stay like that. Like, oh, no, 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 no. There are so many tricks in all these levels. So I'm a firm believer in the education is just so important whether you're going into pet photography or family photography or wedding photography, newborn, whatever. Um, and especially too, uh, for any of you guys out there that are like, oh, I'm a family photographer. I don't maybe want to do pet photography, but this might be a really good podcast because what if a family's like, hey, can we include your dog or our dog or a wedding that they want to bring some photos with their dog? So everybody stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always got... I, I, I loved it when they brought a pet. I got a little nervous when they had a cat just because cats yeah. and I've got three oh, it's cats. a whole different animal. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it is. And the only good shots I get of our cats are with my iPhone. Every time I break out my good camera and lights or anything, they're gone. So yeah. I, yeah. I pretty much have given up on trying to solve that. But I do <laughs> know that, um, you know, horses, pets, uh, my daughter had a snake, a ball python, very photogenic, I had no idea snakes had personalities um, yeah. um, I, I never got used to holding him like my wife and daughter could but wow he was uh, a great pet so uh, but we're going to concentrate kind of on dogs and horses and things here so yeah. um, you know uh, what would you recommend Nicole to somebody who 
is thinking of getting into pet photography, has never really done it. What, where do you start? Okay, so the most important thing, highest, highest, highest priority is to get yourself familiar with some natural history of these animals and their behavior and what their body language means. Because if we can, you know, look at their body language and kind of have an idea if they're comfortable, if they're not comfortable, if they're maybe getting stressed, you know, things like that can help prevent like that situation that you mentioned before of, you know, getting bit in the face, but you know, doesn't have to get that far. Even just photographing the dog, you don't want to photograph a dog that has all these stress signals that you're not getting the best expression from them because their owner is going to know that that's not their dog in a happy state. So you want to just make the situation as positive for the dog, as positive for the owner as possible. And caveat, um, many owners actually aren't very good at reading dog's body language either. Mm -hmm. So as the photographer, we need to be stewards for these animals and make sure that we are really watching their, their body language and we're not pushing it too far. Um, Or if you're somewhere and the dogs, you know, off leash, the owner's like, Oh no, he's fine. But you're watching the situation and the dogs really focused on, you know, not us (laughs) things far away. They're not listening. Um, you know, then we need to be the ones that make these decisions be like, Oh no, no, no. Let's put this dog back on a leash because I can edit it out later. That's one of those tricks up the sleeve. Um, but yeah, learning what that body language means and how to read it and how to, to work with these animals is by far the most important piece of working with dogs. Really good to know. And I forgot to mention, too, you've got a background as a zoological animal trainer, right? I do. Yes. That was my first 13 years um, of my career was training free flight birds and seals and primates and all sorts of stuff. So fun. Um, And it really did give me a a strong background in operant conditioning, like positive reinforcement training. However, you know, you don't have to be like, oh, I have to have this background as a dog trainer, an animal trainer. Uh, You know, there's a lot of great uh, books out there. There's actually one that's called Don't Don't Shoot the Dog by Karen Pryor. It is basically like the operant conditioning Bible. Uh, It's a really good, easy read, and it will really help you get the basics of modifying behavior. And bonus, it works on your kids and your spouse. (laughs) Really good to know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I... We had a dog that would do anything for a treat, anything. Yeah. We had two soft coat and wheat and terriers, and they are high, en- high energy. Mm-hmm. And um, we took both to obedience training class. And Kylie, our first one, uh, the female, the, when we completed the course, we had to have her sit, and then I could walk away about 25 yards and then yep. have her come, you know, but right. she had to wait. Well, she did it fine the first time. Then the second time she started to come and then ran over toward the other dogs. And I looked at the trainer and I said, did we fail? And she said, actually, I'm amazed that she did it the first time. So (laughs) she let me pass. But uh, no, I do you have treats or do you how do you is that a motivator too in a session? Yes. Yeah. So part of my pre session consultation with the owner, I kind of asked them, hey, what's your dog? motivated by because there's varying levels of food motivation like your typical lab or golden retriever as soon as you pull out the food they're just like drooling and can't focus on anything but the food and they're just like oh my god (laughs) and then they might even get like this crazy face or get like too focused on the food Um, and then there's some other dogs that you know are a little bit more nervous or maybe just aren't food motivated Um, you know this is where learning a little bit about the natural history of the different breeds comes in Uh, because photographing a sight hound, like a greyhound is very different than photographing like a, you know, a family lab, uh, because I mean, the sight hounds by their name really aren't into noises. So when you photograph a greyhound, like you've got one shot to like have a novel noise to get the ears forward and that's it. And most dogs, it's like, all right, we can keep changing our noises and I'm still going to get some ears. And sight hounds, it's like one and done. That's all you get. And then you better have somebody like throwing things behind you or running or like a live squirrel. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> it can be really, really challenging. Um, so, yeah. So it's knowing that body language and the natural history uh, is a great way to kind of set yourself up for success. And then, of course, asking the owner to, you know, are they into food? And then I ask kind of on that scale, like, are they food crazy or are they like, meh, 
only into a couple things. Um, are there certain toys that they like, like balls or frisbees? I mean, you get border collies. Sometimes you pull out the ball and then they look insane. Like they get that crazy focused ball border collie face. And you're like, this is not a very good photo. <laughs> <laughs> so it's trial and error a little bit of testing different things. I usually hold off on the food until I really need it. So if there's a dog that's maybe nervous of me or nervous of my camera, all right, I'll pull out the food and do a little um, kind of counter conditioning just right there of just like straight, hey, here's the camera, click food, click food, click food. So it's just like straight up pairing of, hey, this camera is good stuff. Like there's mm -hmm. gonna be food involved. Um, but generally on a session, if I'm photographing a new dog, they're cool with the camera, they're pretty confident and comfortable. Um, I won't pull out any food unless I need it to maybe like do a quick training to get them up on a log or up onto something. Um, but I'll start with as small, um, kind of as small attention getters as I can, which is usually just my voice, like a little, like a little dog whine. Um, then I can pull out some noisemakers. Then I might have a squeaker. Then I might have a ball and like, eventually I might have some treats and you can also kind of ladder your treats through the session. So this works out really well um, for dogs that, you know, maybe are a little bit more food motivated um, or even actually a little bit less. I lied, a little bit less food motivated. So the ones that are super food motivated, like my old dog would eat her kibble all day long. And <laughs> at the end of the day, it was just as exciting as the beginning of the day. But some dogs are like, eh not that exciting anymore so you could start with some kibble and then maybe you have like a soft treat and then maybe you have some cheese and then maybe you have some hot dog and then maybe you have some peanut butter so if your dog starts to lose interest can start kind of upping upping the ante of what you have sure. <laughs> and they're like oh all right i'm back in the game now <laughs> you know you bring up a good point too this is where the pre-consultation is good um like our wheaton was uh -huh. really uh, we had challenges with food and snacks. You could yep. not give her too much mm -hmm. of the wrong thing, and she would be in the hospital. So that's yeah, one right, of the right. things you want to mm -hmm. find out, too, in your consultation. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I ask if there's any allergies, if there's any food restrictions. Um, I always ask before, and then I always ask again when I'm right there. I'm like, I have X, Y, Z. Is it okay if they can have this? So, you know, yeah, always, always ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, when I look at your images too, Nicole, I mean, they're, you've got such a style and I love how you have the angles and I assume you work with uh, a lot of wide angle and normal lenses. Tell me a little bit about the equipment that you recommend and let's get into that a little bit. Sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, the best camera is the camera you have with you, right? So I am not a proponent of telling people like, you need to go out and get the best gear on the market. Not a gearhead. Most of the cameras will do fine. However, as you're learning, you will start to hit up until like you'll learn how to use your gear, like maybe a consumer camera. And then you start to hit up against like, oh, wait, I can't get this. Oh, wait, this focus system isn't very good. So once you start to use or learn to use that kind of more consumer side of gear, um, then when you start to see where your limitations are, OK, maybe it's time to upgrade. Uh, one of the most important things to look for for pet photography is a decent focus system because, you know, if you want to do any action uh, or even if you're not, I mean, they're live animals, they're not going to hold as still as like a, a model. <laughs> um, so, yeah, a focus system. And then lenses, I probably shoot 90% of my images with my 70 to 200 at 200, 2.8. Like I love the compression and the soft, dreamy backgrounds. Um, and then that other 10%, I'm often going pretty wide. So um, at least 24, if not even a little bit wider. Um, but really, a, a long lens is super important. Usually that's kind of like the go-to lens in dog photographers' bags. And then the other lenses depends on personal preference. I have friends that love their 50. I mean... I probably should sell it because I never use it because yeah. I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's just personal preference. Mm -hmm. When uh, talk about to your lighting, how do you handle when you're outdoors yep. versus indoors? All right. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I don't shoot inside a ton. You know, when I do, I'm usually just looking for some window light. Um, but outdoors, this is, I, I don't really have like a set. Like I always do this. I basically 
if I need lights, I'll use lights. If I don't need lights, I won't use lights. Um, I try to set my sessions, you know, around golden hour or the first hour or two in the morning. There's time. So maybe I have to shoot in inopportune times. Like one of my favorite images uh, we captured in New Zealand and we were shooting kind of in the middle of the day because we were going to go up to another location later for actual golden hour. But we still wanted to get like the shot on top of the mountains and it's like it's gnarly side light to get the mountains in the background. So, I mean, you're not going to be able to capture a great image without pulling out some lighting in that case. Um, so I usually have a strobe. I have a pro photo, um, a B1 and a B2. They have all sorts of new ones now, <laughs> but they they still work great. Um, and then usually like a, a beauty dish or somewhere around that like 24 inch kind of octa box. I do have a 30 or 36 inch octa box modifier if I'm doing a bigger group, but that sucker's big. So I like to work with that more about two foot size. Do you have an assistant help you or how do you deal with you know, if I'm going to use a light, yeah, I mm -hmm. hire someone. Um, so I just really usually reach out. Um, you know, we have local photographer groups, usually on Facebook for your market. Uh, and I've hired just other photographers in there of like, hey, I need an assistant. And then I, you know, pay them and they come and they help me with my gear and hold the light. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, it's helpful. And I know the I know the limits of my marriage, Mark, and having my husband <laughs> help would not be good. <laughs> you know, that's uh, marriage counseling otherwise, right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> like when, you, <laughs> when you do photograph like a, a darker animal, I well, let me back up here for a second. Are you shooting everything raw so you have yes. the ultimate control? Yeah, I mm -hmm. figured that must be. Yeah. And how many images do you typically take in a session, would you say? Depends. Um, you know, if I'm shooting action, who the heck knows? Because that... <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that adds to your bottom line pretty quickly. Um, generally, if it's more of a portrait session, um, I probably shoot 300, 350 images. I usually show my clients about 30 to 40. Mm -hmm. um, so generally, not counting action, I probably keep about 10% of what I shoot has been my kind of And when you, um, yeah, as you made a good point there too, it's important it's one thing to overshoot, but don't overshow because then yeah. it blows the sale mm -hmm. because people can't decide. Right. Um, and when you do your photography, are you kind of, um, are you photographing to be able to sell a book or? Artwork. Wall mm -hmm. art is my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, I actually used to love doing like wall galleries. Now, um, I've really been focused on like, I've been loving just selling like one big signature epic art piece. Um, and then people usually add on an album and or digital files to like their big signature art piece. So you're probably when you're doing a session, you're probably looking for, okay, we got a good shot here, just move the dog a little different? Or do you go to a different location? So you get good variety? How do you handle that? Yeah, I love variety. Um, generally for most locations, I'm looking for like three different looks, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. like, oh, I could have a natural spot here. I can have a background of the lake here. Um, you know, and then within each kind of scene, um, you know, again, it depends on the consultation. Like if this is a session and they really want just an awesome picture of their dog, I'm going to shoot more of just the dog. If they're looking for a family photo of them and their dog, we're going to shoot more of that. So uh, really just comes down to talking with them. Um, I always do ask them if there's any particular images on my website that they love so that I can make sure that I capture something similar to that as well. Good to know. Yeah, there's um, so many things that goes into uh, the success of, I don't care what kind of photography mm -hmm. it is, but um, when you, how do you handle your sales then? So do you do it immediately following or three or four days no. later? How do yeah, you do it's it? about a, between a week and two weeks mm -hmm. uh, in-person sales. Well, I've been calling it live sales because some people still do Zoom. Most people are back to coming to my, um, I have a sales room in my home, so they come here. And then you project and? Uh, TV, I don't project, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I have the TV, um, use Pro Select and um, yeah, show them. Showing them their image on their wall is, such an important important piece if you want to sell bigger wall art. The other thing that I noticed too is I used to go to people's homes, which is also a great thing. I, you know, I want to squash anyone out there that's like, ah, I can't, I don't have a studio or I don't have a space in my room, my house. 
So, you know, I can't do in-person sales. Like I don't want to go to their house because I don't know, it doesn't, they'll be more impressed coming to me. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, if you're going to them, I think that's even a higher level of service because you're meeting them. These are busy people. You're meeting them in their home. You can look around their house. So not having a studio space, don't let that deter you from, um, you know, meeting people to go over things. Uh, That's a great together. point. Yeah. yeah. I recently had a, a gentleman that I photographed him with his, in his man cave. Yeah. And I made a lot of trips to his home to help do sales. And, uh, you know, you mentioned something too, that I think is so important. You don't have to have a projector as long as you've got a monitor that you mm-hmm. can either take with you or use their TV Yep. I I've done like, that before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like the control of having my own monitor just because it's color balanced and yep. you know, it's a little weird sometimes hauling it around, but you know, if they can't come to you, um, and that's the way this gentleman was very busy and yep. very professional and appreciated it. And the sales was, um, you know, worth it. And he right. also, I helped him hang it, um, you know, on his wall cause he had multiple canvas wraps that we ended up selling. But, um, so anyway, as you look at um, your, do you have, let's talk about your promotional materials because yeah. I got to brag about you for a little bit here because your website is one of the absolute best I've ever seen and I'll put Aww, a link thanks. to it. Yeah. And I talked about this when I was doing my program at the Animal Image Makers. If you really want to know what you should have for a website, go to Nicole's website because everything you should be doing is on her website. <laughs> and one thing I really loved is your video and yeah. you're also you your um it says Nicole Bagley photography and I think it says something like obsession with animal photography or something like that. Yeah, it's even... like expressive photography for the animal obsessed. Yeah, I that's think. it. I yeah. forget my own tagline. <laughs> When you re- <laughs> when you uh, read artistic that, photography for the animal obsessed. There yeah. you go. That's it. Yep. When you read that as a consumer, yet alone a professional photographer, a colleague, you immediately go, "This person is different. This person mm-hmm. is an expert. This person knows that I'm a nut about my own pet as well. Yep. I'm not afraid to say." how much I obsess over my pet. So everything that's on your page says that. So it's a safe site. Yeah, which is really important because that's actually one of the main objections in pet photography. There's really, there's three. There's people are worried their dog's not going to behave. So we need to address that on our website. Um, Actually, we need to address that everywhere we can, social media, website, consultation, all of the time. Um, And then they're also worried that their dog can't be off leash. So we need to address that as well. And then third is that they are worried that like, what are people going to think that I'm hiring a professional pet photographer photographer to photograph my dog? Because there's, you know, especially to, you know, our, my target client is usually people without children. So they might be young couples that haven't had kids yet or young women that maybe aren't engaged or married yet. Or a lot of my clients are, um, you know, middle-aged women that have a dog that maybe they're not married or they are married, but they chose not to have kids. And you have all the society pressure basically telling them like, Hey, you're wrong for not having kids. You're going to regret it. Blah, 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 blah. And then they have this like weird, like, I mean, what are people going to think now that I'm spending $2,000 on this big picture of my dog? So when you look at your target client, you know, uh, it's, it's important to have some demographics, of course, that's a good starting point, but it goes so much deeper than figuring out, okay, where did they shop? What do they do on the weekend? You actually want to get down to like, what do they value? What are they concerned about? What, how do they feel about their dog? How will they feel about having artwork on their house? Um, you know, and like just really diving into those values and feelings because once you start to hit that, then you can speak to that person and you're going to attract just such a better quality client. And you're just going to speak directly to these people that are like, oh my gosh, this person understands me. That is such good information, Nicole. I honestly hadn't ever really considered that. Um, yeah. You know, I, 
it makes perfect sense now. But honestly, that's boy, if you learn nothing else from this podcast, there's your number one. <laughs> so let me go just one step further. How do you overcome that then with them? Uh, it's really, I mean, it's from the copy on my website, like, you know, animal obsessed here's I'm showing pictures of, um, you know, artwork with just your dog in your home. Uh, it comes down to when I chat with them, I ask about the dog, I ask about what they'd love to do with their dog, you know, their favorite things just to start to get those values. Um, one of my favorite questions to ask is, of course, have you given any thought as to what you want to do with your images afterwards? I also ask, like, what's the most important thing for you in choosing a pet photographer, which is a great question to kind of, well, are they looking for value? Are they looking for artwork? Are they looking for style? Are they looking for, you know, someone that knows dogs? And, you know, you're not going to sales a service, right? And when they answer and you elicit those values, you can speak to them. This isn't, and I can hear the, the resistance to some people like, oh, that seems slimy. No, no, you're just speaking to them by what's important to them. You're not making up like what you offer. Uh, you're just highlighting the, the angles of what you offer that's most important to them. So it just makes that connection. Um, and I mean, there is nothing more important than your inquiry process than trying to actually speak to your person or get that appointment to get a consultation, you know, depending on what your workflow is. Um, and one of the ways that I have found some of my students have found recently that has made a huge difference, which I need to update my update or my website. It's not <laughs> there yet. Uh, <laughs> at that time. But um, if you go to the get started page, that it can be a video of, um, of you saying, Hey, thanks so much. Here's the next step in the process. Um, you know, go ahead and schedule a meeting right here. So having a place on your website that they can schedule their pre-consultation meeting with you, um, cause people are busy and it's really frustrating when you fill out a form and then they have to wait two days to get back to you. Mm. One of the other ways you can do it, if you still want them to fill out a form, totally fine. But instead of it just being like, Hey, thanks, we'll get in touch. Even if it automatically sends an email, what if after they submitted that form, it goes to a thank you page on your website that has a video of you saying, hey, thanks so much for inquiring. I'm so excited to meet your dog. And again, you can talk about those objections um, and you can normalize the fact that they're going to spend money on pet photography. <laughs> and then you just tell them, hey, our next step is to jump on a no obligation call so I can find out you know, exactly what it is that we want to create. I can give you a custom quote and we can just, you know, start diving into this and then having a calendar right there embedded on that page. Um, my one student went from, oh gosh, she was getting of her inquiries. She would get like 30 to 35% of people to finally book that consultation. Um, when she switched it and that was after following up when she switched it, it was 75% of people would book it right away on the thank you page without her having to follow up. And we all know once we actually talk to these clients, um, nine times out of 10, they usually end up booking. So huge way to, yeah. Just You're make incorporating most... video better than anybody I know. And I'm so impressed with that. And I'm often amazed that more don't. I think, you know, there's um, plenty of education in our industry that supports that. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm wondering what is, what is the hold back? Is it hard to do a video or well, what do you think? Well, I think, yeah, I think part of it is people don't know how. Um, you know, whenever we procrastinate on something, it's for one of two reasons. Either we don't know how, so we just procrastinate because we don't know what steps to take, or there's some sort of fear underlying. So I think that a lot of us, especially in the pet photography industry, are introverted and, like, don't want to put ourselves out there. And, like, oh, nobody wants to see a video of me. But that's wrong because we're a personal <laughs> brand and your potential clients do want to see a video of you and they are going to connect with you. And the people that maybe don't, we're never going to hire you anyway. So there's there's no reason not to. And it doesn't have to be hard. I mean, our phones, our phones are so easy. Just like set your phone up on a little tripod. You can get, I have it, it's over there, but I have a little Manfrotto tabletop um, phone holder that I don't know. It was not very expensive. Definitely under a hundred bucks, maybe under $50. And you can just set that up, 
face a window so you have nice pretty light and just talk to your camera and you can even download there's apps called like a teleprompter app that are free or really inexpensive so if you're not sure like i'm gonna mess up my words all right type it out put it in that app and then you can read it and it just comes up on the side of your screen so it doesn't look like you're reading it um and then if you want to like really one take boom put it up there done if you really want to take it up a level all right well then go ahead and take that raw video that you had and grab someone on fiverr or upwork to edit video send them some of your still images send them some images of your artwork on the walls send them that raw video and just tell them to you know hey let's make a nice little video there so you don't have to be like oh i have to go spend two three thousand dollars on a videographer to do this professional video no you can 100 percent do it yourself or for just, you know, 50 bucks or so hiring someone on Upwork or Fiverr. You know, it personalizes your business so much. And that's the mm -hmm. thing that separates you from the competition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's why it's so important to incorporate that everywhere you can. I know um, Suzette Allen does a lot of things with live portrait. And mm -hmm. that's something, too, when you have your promotional cards, uh, holiday cards, I should say. Well, even for your own business. Um, with that app, you can have that come to life and it can be an ad on sales. It can be an incentive. I mean, there's so many mm -hmm. benefits to video. And I got to say, I know the first time I started looking at videos like, oh man, you know, I've got to get lights. I got to get a microphone. Then you right. realize, keep it simple. You know, you can yeah. do a you lot of stuff. You can use this little earbud or mm -hmm. not. Just be in a quiet spot and it'll be fine. Yeah. It's just your phone. Yeah. And people... I think, you know, as long as the content is genuine and real, I don't mm -hmm. think people care how yeah. polished, in fact, maybe not being so polished makes you more appealing mm -hmm. to some people. Yeah. And you know, and it doesn't have to be long. In fact, like I would try to keep it under 90 seconds because people mm -hmm. have zero attention span. So you don't have to create this 10 minute video, you know, just a couple seconds so you can say, hey, they get to like see you because like it or not humans we make judgments about people in like 0.2 seconds i don't know what the actual stat is but it's really really fast so when you have a video of yourself on the site i mean a picture must video highly recommend because then your potential clients will automatically either be more connected to you or less and like i said if they're less connected to you that's fine they were never going to hire you anyway so you really have nothing to lose we are humans we make snap to ju judgments we decide who we like and who we don't like on first impressions. It's just our human nature. Yeah, you can overcome that a little bit, but like just do the video. And I promise you the people that connect with you, which there are more that connect with you than won't, um, will get drawn in. And because you had that video, they're going to have a stronger connection with you over the other photographers that don't. You know, you bring up a really good point, too, about keep your video short. You know, mm -hmm. that's the other thing I think people worry about as well. I got content. I got to figure out what to say. You know, like you said, 90 seconds or less because the attention mm -hmm. span of people is so limited. So, yep. yeah. In yeah, fact, if it's it a can't turn fit off. in a TikTok, like, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you can't even do it. <laughs> yep. Speaking of TikTok, how, what is your number one way of advertising, Nicole? Oh, it is not social media. <laughs> <laughs> That's really I, rare to hear. I know. It's I've I've gotten better. Um my social media journey has been a challenging one over the many years because I had two. I had one for hair of the dog, I had one for my photography business. I never knew where to post or what to share or what to do on which, and so it felt completely overwhelming. So this past year I gave myself permission. I'm like I'm just going to do one Nicole Bagley official boom. It can be education. It can be for clients. It can be for all the things it's me and it's my business. Um, and that has been really helpful and freeing, but, um, yeah, I always have been like social media has been kind of the icing on my marketing cake. It has never been my marketing cake. Um, my marketing cake has quite frankly been, it's not sexy or exciting relationships, old school, knowing people in your market, now, before everyone's like, Meh, I don't know people in my market. <laughs> yeah, either did I when I moved to North Carolina. I knew one person. I knew my brother that lived here. <laughs> and he didn't even have too many local connections either because they hadn't been here that long. Um, and he's a pilot, so he's always traveling. So, um, you know, you can make those connections. And one of my favorite things to do is charitable marketing, where you connect with a rescue or a charity of some kind and you can donate to their silent auction 
But even above that, you can talk to them about, hey, I would love to offer a special opportunity to your supporters. So it's basically like a discounted session that, and I worry about the word discounted. It's not like you're just slashing prices. You're not Kohl's. You are, um, you know, just either giving them an add-on. It's it's a better deal than if they contacted you directly in book. So there's like, oh, this is awesome. And then you make an offer for them. You take part of that offer and it's uh, a donation to the charity. So the charity goes to their supporters and says, hey, we've partnered with Nicole Bagley Photography. Instead of her usual $299 session fee, she's going to have you know a $199 session fee and you're still going to get that $299 credit, whatever. this That offer can look like a million different things. Um, and then when you book a session in the next two weeks to be held this summer, uh, you know, $50 be donated back to the charity. So the charity wins, they raise money. Your clients win because they're getting a little bit of a better deal and it forces them to make a decision because they're like, oh, that deal's going away. And you're getting great clients. Um, and you don't need to have the list, you know, because they're marketing it to their people. So that's a great way to grow your awareness in a market, to get some clients in the door. Um, and you already have an affinity, like you're the people that support that charity already have an affinity for your brand because you are supporting a charity that they love too. So they already are like, oh, I already like this person. I already like this brand. So it's a win, win, win. And then when you go through it, um, I've usually done full sessions. You can do like a mini session, limited edition type thing too. But for like a full session, I go through the same process. I tell them it's the same pricing, it's the same offer. And, you know, the clients that would come through that ended up being, you know, my average sale, $2,500, $3,000 for a, a full session, doing the artwork, doing the albums, doing all the things. So, yeah. When, yeah. When you're, all right, you were new going into South Carolina there. Yep. What, you know, okay, so you reached out to the charitable people and I'm, and I'm mm -hmm. going to ask, was it a phone call? A email what was your first contact in email or this is where social media is helpful um, you can start interacting with those different charities on social media um, and then I've actually had a lot of success reaching out to different businesses or charities through social media um, so that is a, a great tool um, but yeah usually if you just reach out to them I have found um, you know, a lot of people think it needs to be like the big shelter in their area. I love the big shelter and I do what I can to support them as well. But I found more success with that, um, charitable session strategy with smaller rescues because they are more excited to promote it because if I can donate $500 to them, that's a way bigger chunk of their budget than the giant municipal shelter. Um, and so they're like, oh, yeah, they're way more into it. And their supporters are usually like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. They love <laughs> that that um, organization. So, you know, I definitely don't discount the smaller. You bring up a great point. Shelters. The last cat we adopted came from a small shelter uh, run by a one person operation. And mm -hmm. it's um, they need the most help and they have yeah. some volunteers, but they could really use the um, the advertising and the additional publicity. And yep. uh, so you bring it, that's a great point too. And the great thing about this, once you flesh it out and do it once, oh man, just switch out the logo, boop, new one every month, every quarter, you know, however often you want to do it. Do you network with um, like trainers and, you know, dog food or dog stores or pet yeah, animal yeah. stores? How do you do that? You definitely can. Um, like you can network with trainers and maybe give a little, Hey, congratulations for your, uh, obedience training graduation. Here's a, you know, a little, um, gift certificate or something like that. So, I mean, sky's the limit. When we were in St. Louis and, uh, we had our first Wheaton that I mentioned, Kylie, um, we would go every Monday as a family. So it was really fun. And we found this trainer through a lot of recommendations. They, they told me she was really good. She wasn't the least expensive, but she was yeah. really good. And so we went and every Monday we'd have a little picnic before going in. And the one thing I told my wife, Jill, at the time, I said, you know, 
if I were still doing photography today on a regular basis, I would network with this trainer because the cars were Mercedes Benz, uh -huh. Porsches, Land Rovers. Wow, you know, it yeah. was like it was like a car show. Uh -huh. you know? Right, right. <laughs> so it was it was one of those things where I thought, you know, you first of all, you bond so much with your new pet uh -huh. over those several weeks, and then once you leave there, if you would have something that. Um, you know, would give you the opportunity to have a portrait made with your pet. Yep. Boy, why wouldn't you do it? And it's a yeah. win for them. And, you know, they give, they give you, give that as a gift. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Tell me about your printed support material too. Cause I know working at Marathon here, I've seen your stuff come through and I, I'm always like, oh, that's cool. And the big plus piece that you use. That what? one's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> it is cool. Yeah. I'll try to put a picture of it on the in the video mix here when we do it. But uh, how do you use that? What's your what's your support material? I look originally like? used that one for um, silent auction winners, um, or if anybody bought a gift certificate. Um, now I've started using it as kind of one of my welcome pieces of when they book a session. Comes with a little note inside. And uh, it just immediately lets them know, reinforces the value of what they've just done. Like, it's a beautiful piece. So it just helps helps make my prices make more sense, if you know what I mean. <laughs> it does. It absolutely yeah. does. It adds that, how do I put it? When somebody has spent some money with you mm -hmm. or is kind of starting to or they know yep. they're going to the last thing you want them to think is have second thoughts i guess yeah and right that's and, what you that know, piece they, does mm -hmm. i'm sure it's subconsciously for them too it's like oh look how beautiful this piece is my final artwork's going to be gorgeous too like yeah. everything that's coming through the studio is high quality absolutely yeah. mm -hmm. uh is there any other uh material printed materials do you have a printed price oh, list yeah what do yeah, you yeah um i I, my price list has not been printed. It's been on my list to like maybe do like a little magazine. I did have a session guide. Um, Cause I'm debating if I, I haven't totally settled on like, oh, am I happy with where my prices are right now or not? Which is why I haven't printed it. Cause I change my pricing as often as people change their socks um, <laughs> because I love to just test out different pricing things. Cause it's like my favorite thing to do. Um, but I had a, it's like a five by seven printed guide on like the super thick paper. It was like 16 pages or eight, eight pages. Maybe I think it was eight pages, but it was my session guide. So when they booked, they would get that. Um, and it would go through, let them know how to prepare for their session, rescheduling stuff, like just some regular terms and things like that. Um, and then of course I've have like a folded thank you card and some, you know, flat cards and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, the, pl yeah. the plus piece is my favorite. Speaking of your um, price list, uh, do you have collections or how, how do you handle your you know, a la carte and collections? How do you handle that? Um, yes and no. So I have had collections probably more. Actually, if you go to my website, you'll still see collections on there. I need to update that too. Um, I think what I'm going to be doing just started testing out with the last couple clients and so <laughs> I like it so far um is that you know I I have collections I've had collections they're great I love them I've also done a la carte great I love it I've done a build your own collection I have literally tested out every pricing strategy under the sun like I said because I mean I also do a lot of teaching so I do want to test it out and see um and what I found was that my average sale was pretty darn consistent, no matter how I did it. So lesson learned there is, all right, figure out what you want to be selling and then build your price list. And don't, don't like feel like there's always something oh, I'm missing. I need to change it. There's two questions that I ask myself and I have my students ask themselves regards pricing. Number one is, am I selling one? I want to be selling. So if you want to sell like a big wall piece, and you're selling an album every time, okay, we need to adjust our pricing or look at how we're structuring things. Um, the other question is, am I making enough profit? So look at your numbers, know your cost of goods sold. Um, you know, of course we can always tweak and be more profitable, but 
generally you're like, man, I need to make $1,500 a session, but I'm selling 500. Everybody's just buying 500 and stopping. Okay, let's look at our price list. Something needs to change. Um, so if you could say yes to those two questions, am I selling what I wanna be selling? And am I making enough profit from each session on average? Then your pricing is good. Um, one of the things I do love to do is I'm always looking at people's price lists, including my own, and asking myself, like, what is encouraging people to take the next step? So like a general a la carte meh, can be kind of tough unless it's a la carte, but with bonuses. So like, hey, if you purchase a 20 by 30 or larger wall piece, you save $500 off an album. Or if you do an album and a wall piece, then you can get 20 complimentary digital files. Like you can make these different like little bonus structures 8,000 ways. But the key is to ask yourself, how much money do I want? Like do the work and say, how many sessions am I gonna do a year? Well, how much money do I need to make? How much will go to cost of goods sold? How much does it go to my doing business costs? Um, so you figure out like, okay, I need to actually be making $2,000 sales at a 25% cost of goods sold, um, what do I want them to buy? Okay, how can I set up my pricing so that like when they buy that, it's by far like the best value in my pricing. So by having some sort of bonus or something that gets unlocked or digital files get less expensive or digital files are included for certain things so that it's not just like, okay, here's your menu. Yeah, I'll take that and that because there's no motivation for them to to be to add on to it you know what i mean yes i i find that especially with albums um i mean some people that i know love albums so their whole business is around the albums it's on the website they're talking about the albums so their clients are coming to them for albums different story um i love the wall art but i also love to add on an album because it's a great story for the client you know they become more valuable over time um but if I was just having this price list of it's like pick a wall piece, pick an album, most people don't. They're just going to get like a wall piece, and maybe some prints. Um, but if you have, uh, you know, do a wall piece, do an album and you get digital files or you get a discount or something like that, then it encourages them. It turns them um, into value seekers instead of like looking for like the discounts or just figuring out like talking themselves out of doing things when you have this like special offer they're like oh well that makes sense why wouldn't we do that <laughs> yeah. very good information um any before we run out of time nicole yeah. is there anything else you want to add that maybe would help people that are first getting into starting pet photography yeah absolutely just to get around these animals you know um ask friends photograph you can go photograph in the shelter shelter photography is some of the hardest pet photography because those poor animals are scared so you know they if you can get a decent expression from those animals in that situation man normal portrait clients are going to be a breeze um, but really just spending time around these animals so you can start looking at that natural history looking at that behavior their body language um, that is the key to being able to do this safely and well, uh, especially if you want to photograph horses. I mean, these are big animals that can be dangerous. So you need to be comfortable being around them. So even if you go volunteer at like a therapeutic riding center or take a couple lessons yourself, you know, you don't have to become a world-class rider, but you should spend a little time around horses or large animals so that you can become a little bit more comfortable with it. And, um, yeah, just get out there, practice, have fun, and what yeah, is a? I've it. always wanted to ask too. Um, what is a good pet expression? Tongue in, mouth closed. Oh, what? <laughs> what it is depends. It? I used to ask my clients, "Do you prefer like a closed mouth, serious face, or open mouth, like tongue smile?" Um, and they don't know. They would answer, but then they would always select like the other one. So I just now show. Um, I collect some of both. So I, I'll get the serious faces where the dog has their mouth closed and ears up. Um, and then I'll get like the happy faces where they look like they're smiling with their tongues out a little bit um, because owners don't really know until they see it. And then they see it and they're like, that's my fluffy, yep. <laughs> you and know? So what yeah, about just, PPA judging? What do they prefer? 
It depends. It depends on the story, too. You know, if you have this happy, smiley dog and the story is about his happy adventure, you know, then that makes sense. Um, you know, so much so much of print competition comes down to the story of the image. And um, minus that, I know one of the kind of, you know, quote rules is making sure nose to ears are in focus. Um, but I think you could probably get away without that if it was the story, you mm -hmm. know, so if the story was like something about the eyeball, you know, like, I don't know what that would be, but, um, you know, you know, you bring up a story. good point because you shoot at 2.8 and mm -hmm. of course it's, you know, full length usually, but if it's a close up, um, and you do want to get that nose to eyes mm -hmm. in focus, are you shooting at least at F8? What do you recommend? No, uh, for my private client stuff, I'm pretty much fairly wide open all the time. Okay. Um, yeah. And yeah, for print competition, the images I go gravitate towards for those tend to be a little bit more kind of environmental with the whole dog in it. So at 2.8, the whole dog is sharp. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I haven't really done any of the, although I did do some of my selfies, um, my selfie dogs and those, <laughs> those hit or miss. It depends on the panel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Depends if they have a sense of humor or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I've been there too. I, I've had some that have scored really well and others that's like, they didn't get the genius of my image. Uh -huh, right, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah. Nicole, thank you so much for being with me today. I, I, I Let's do this again another time because it's always fun. Yeah, but, so um, much stuff to talk about. Oh, sure. Tell me too, if people want to reach you, how do they contact you for your education, your workshops, sure. your everything? How do they reach yeah. you? Yeah. Um, we have hair of the dog academy.com is our main education site. Nicole Bagley photography.com is my photography site. Um, hair of the dog podcast is my podcast. And um, yeah, most of those places, we do have a workshop coming up in Spain in October, uh, Barcelona. That's at pet photography retreats.com. <laughs> And I teach that with um, Kaylee Greer from Dog Breath Photography in Boston and also Charlotte Reeves from Charlotte Reeves Photography all the way down under in Brisbane, Australia. So it is a blast and we just have a couple seats left. Oh, that's cool. Well, I'm Mark Weber. You can reach me here at 800-228-0629, extension 283, or Mark W at marathonpress.net. Uh, thank you again, Nicole. It was a blast having you. Very educational. We'll chat with you too soon. Thanks, Mark.